Good morning and welcome to the First Congregational Church, as Pastor Richard said, the church in our <coughs> village. Um, glad you could be here today with us. And I would like to introduce our supply minister for the day, Reverend Joanne Painter.
29. God is supreme, the Lord is king, and the people tremble. He sits on his throne above the wind of creatures and the earth shakes. The Lord is mighty in Zion. He is supreme over all the nations. Everyone on the is his great and majestic name. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were his priests.
Hi, I wanted to say the girl that fell off the horse a few weeks ago has made a really good recovery. And she has no side effects from the fall from fracturing her skull. And she's doing well. And also I want to bring up a, a, an experience that happened. This week I had two young boys, two young Christians with Bibles come to my back door. And I'm kind of not too open to having visitors knock on my door. And I just looked at those two young people and said, I belong to the church down the street, and I don't want your track. And I realized after they had left, because they were very loving young people, and they, my dog liked them immediately. <laughs> so, but I realized what I should have done, because I, I gave it to prayer, and what I should have done is welcomed them in the house, and also given them some hot cocoa and made them feel welcome. And if I had to do it all over again, that's what I would do. And I, I gave it to prayer for, for a while. And I read Isaiah 42 through 43. And basically what I got out of that is this thing about God is God, God created everything, and God has dominion over all things, you know, which means that we, uh, our job is to acknowledge his presence in our lives, and part of acknowledging our presence in our lives is being welcoming to young people and helping them on their journey, which I forgot. And I really am, am sorry that I did that, but there's nothing I can do about it now except pray about it and hope that they'll come back so that I have another chance of welcoming them into my house. So anyway, that's a lesson learned. For all of us. Amen. Amen. We're in Florida. And Emily ran a half marathon at Disney this morning, the Princess Marathon, and she did awesome. So we are, thank God she's okay. It's a joy. Uh, in four days, I will be in Florida. Great. <laughs> and Eddie Beth Dowdy asked me to say hello to the congregation and said they'd be back soon. Thank you. Get the microphone, Melissa. Wonders what I'm going to say. <laughs> Somebody had a birthday last Tuesday. <laughs> and it wasn't me. <laughs> I won't say her age. <laughs> but maybe Reggie Jackson had that, that number on the <laughs> I said maybe.
May the people whose names we lifted up in the service and in silence receive your healing touch. May those who are out, out there preaching the word <coughs> and those who study it find the courage to continue. May their needs for support be provided. We dedicate ourselves once again to renewing our faith. We will seek the pathways to experiencing the mystical encounters with you that solidify our assurance of your reality and trust in your power to bring about good. Help us please to make wholesome cho choices. Amen. And in Jesus' name, we pray together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I shall read the story of the transfiguration. 
And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is well that we are here. If you wish, I will make three booths here, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, lo, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were filled with awe. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And Peter writes his letters to various people. And I shall read from the second letter of Peter. To whom? Well, first verse it says, To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours in the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. So he writes to anyone who is bearing the, those qualifications. Yes. I'm reading from the first chapter, verses 16 through 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We heard this voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, and we have the prophetic word made more sure. You will do well to pay attention to this, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by the impulse of man, but, by, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And so is the reading of our Holy Scriptures. And may we be blessed by it. George A. Buttrick wrote the commentary for the Gospel of Matthew in the Interpreter's Bible. And George A. Buttrick writes beautifully of the Transfiguration. The Transfiguration story was precious to the early church. And it has enriched all ages of Christian, um, all ages of Christianity. Each of the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is brilliant in the simplicity of its writing and passing rich in illusion. The story itself is such a sudden light that we are gladly constrained to believe. It must have come from awe-filled actuality. The main fact is theophany. Theophany is God to us. Every line of the picture portrays God's visitation. Every illusion underscores the fact of the divine glory. Six days is an echo of the experience of Moses on Mount Sinai. Transfigured in this company of revelation, words can only mean transformation into higher nature, 
shown shining again. Notice the echo of the Mount Sinai story. Shown shining implies the divine light. White garments are the high priestly robes of the Messiah. The bright cloud is the Shekinah, or cloud of God's glory. Whence came the divine voice? Even Bruce may have its apocalyptic overtone. Did the three disciples believe in that burning light that God had come to dwell with men, and that they therefore must provide a new tabernacle? Moses and Elijah, according to Jewish faith, had not tasted death, but were to be the forerunners of the great day of the final age. The central and overpowering truth, which no interpreter should miss, is the truth of God in Christ. The transfiguration is not merely the divine seal on the ministry of Jesus. It records the fact that God has broken into our world through him, through Jesus. The experience was thus God's signature on the choice and commitment that Jesus has made. So ends that quote. So this experience of Jesus follows why and how a vision comes to be. He was stressed. He had a lot of decisions to make. He knew he had God's blessing for his ministry. He had heard the bath call at his baptism. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But in this experience, there is something new. This is the end of the ministry. There very well may, be, may have been doubts. There were thoughts of death. Had his path been the right path, exactly what God wanted of him? When Jesus was ministering, he needed rest. So he took in brief retreats in the wilderness. He prayed to God to open his direction. He fasted to clear his body. And when he had regrouped, he entered again his ministry with energy and enthusiasm. He taught quietly with gentle love. He taught boldly with strong love. Jesus healed with the energy of heaven and earth and went straight to the causes of the illnesses. Jesus preached with the words, lessons, concepts, and truths that were given to him through study and prayer. He was always open to the ministry of the divine. He allowed the Holy Spirit to work in him and guide him with each and every encounter. <coughs> Compassion led his way. Sorrow and sympathy was compelling Jesus, motivating him to use all that he had through God's Holy Spirit to heal the wounded and save the souls of God's children. God is well pleased with this son. Preceding the point when Jesus ascends the mountain, Jesus holds a quiet time of teaching and questioning to see how ready the disciples are to continue in this ministry. They will not be fully ready until the Holy Spirit comes and touches each one of them at Pentecost. They will then be empowered, but until then, they will wait and be silent. Jesus knows it is time to ascend the mountain. He must know where they stand. In order to know who to take with him, he asks the question, Who do you say that I am? Out of faith, Peter answers, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the moment of Peter's epiphany. Jesus takes Peter, James, and James' brother John to witness. They will later be 
be witnesses. Jesus did not ascend the mountain in the same manner in which he entered the wilderness. Those were quiet times in the wilderness. This mountain had to do with the very core of his faith. It was his high hour of vision. We cannot always dwell in the shadows and the lowlands. There's a mountain top that gives certainty. Jesus was confirmed and affirmed and well loved throughout his ministry by God. But now what? Faith is an expectancy of the soul. Jesus expected what? Did he know? Faith is a trust into the future. It is an innate trust in God. It has been said that faith is mixed with human clay and is thus our birthright. Faith is quickened. It comes alive constantly by God's signs. Faith gains its strength and steadfastness of nature. Faith grows into the fellowship of fellow human beings. Faith is enhanced in secret. It is mysterious experiences with God that give us life. Faith opens wide in Jesus Christ. Jesus must now open wide in God. Jesus must go up and trust that God's will is divine. Whatever else goes on in the valley, what we receive on the mountaintop is to be obeyed and cannot be denied. It must be proclaimed. The glory of God is. We now know. We now have. We now take it to the valley and we give. The glory of God changes everything. The voice of God says, listen to him. The voice of God has added a directive that will cause Jesus to speak and people to listen. Important words. They are the words of salvation. Jesus was fortified to face his short future on earth in human form. So be it. He will go down to the mountain, to the valleys. He has been affirmed by Moses in the law. He has been affirmed by Elijah in the prophets. He is the Son of God. His task and purpose is solidified. He loved, and that was his purpose to learn to love, and he loved. Christ's ministry continues toward an ending. The disciples are quiet. They must wait. But on Pentecost, they speak, and they keep talking, proclaiming to the world of Christ's salvation all over the Mediterranean Sea and beyond. Peter proclaims his witness to the vision. It was real. The inspiration that gained, he gained, carried him through his ministry. His letters inspired many people and gave them heart in a time that was hard and brutal. The news and his letters of the transfiguration gave hope. It gave inspiration and encouragement to many displaced people who were afflicted with sorrow, doubt, and discouragement. The news of a real vision of God drew in many people to experience their own spiritual experience with God. The certainty with which Peter could speak was genuine and made a powerful difference for those who were searching for a solid connection to a loving God this God cared and came through to be in such a one as Jesus, as this compassionate Jesus. 
God was in Christ, reconciling the world to God's self. People felt the divine security known as salvation. The glory of God shines in the valleys, in the shadows, in every dark place. Peter, James, and John shared the vision of God who spoke, be at peace. God's light is powerful. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our hymn of meditation. Hymn number 298. God is working his purpose out.
please be sure to join us for Shrove Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, and a pancake supper. It will be at 5.30 at the Parish House. And as always, we'll have a pancake flipping contest for both the kids and adults. Following the supper at 7 o'clock, we will have a council meeting. All committees are asked to have a member present. And Clerk Dottie would love it if you could email her your reports before 5.30 on Tuesday. Wednesday, March 4th, we will have an Ash Wednesday service here in the sanctuary. Please. March, February. What did I say? March. That's right, I'm way ahead. All right, let's start again. <laughs> This Wednesday, we will have Ash Wednesday service. It will be 7 p.m. here at the church in the sanctuary. And we would love to have you join us as we begin the season of Lent. A couple of weeks ago, we had on display some dresses that the ladies of the church had made for the uh, Little Dresses for Africa project. I sent them off, and we got a card back and it says on behalf of the children thank you so much for your help and the new March newsletter is out if you did not get it via email there are copies up back good morning as many of you know, there was a church supper last night. <laughs> and if you look around at a few people, you can tell that we're a little bit tired. We yeah. had very few people helping. We just barely had enough food. Mm -hmm. And there were a few pieces of pie up back at refreshment time. Um, but if we're going to do suppers, we're going to need some help, folks. <laughs> uh, the, we had a wonderful turnout as far as people went. Thank you for those of you who came and ate with us. Thank of you for the people that made things and, and worked. Um, it was really just right as far as the food. Um, and everybody just was so happy when they were leaving. Uh, the prophet, thanks to a couple of people this morning, came out to be 802 cents. $800 and two cents. <laughs> Thank you to someone who put the two cents in. <laughs> um, as of the public supper in March, we will be rise, raising our prices a dollar more. So that will put some more money into our treasury. Uh, and I think there's a sign-up sheet still up back, right, for, for uh, next month. And there are a few things like the beans downstairs if you want to help yourself. Uh, not a lot, but a few. Uh, so thank you, everybody that helped in any way with the supper. And it was fun, but I'll tell you, there are a couple of us, three of us, I think, that were here for a lot of hours. <laughs> so let's think about what we can do, how we can help. Thank you so much. Are there any other announcements? Just real quick, I am finally getting around to getting the financial statements um, from 2019, which is the summary of um, our um, financial contributions to the church, which um, we need to take care of Mr. Taxman. Um, I have them. Um, um, some of them printed at the flyer. I've got um, your statements. I'll catch you on the way back through. Um, there's a few of you that have um, again my PDFs that have not gotten up this week. So if you don't hear from me by next Sunday, give me a nudge because that means I've, I've missed it somehow. I've had a little trouble with my computer this week, but um, you should have them uh, by Sunday or next week. Yes, and MOFH will meet today after church. Announcement-wise, uh, the results of the Lenten study survey are in, and 
it was an overwhelming request to have it other than Wednesday night. I'm sorry, choir. Uh, so we're going to be having it on Thursday nights, and to make it a little bit more convenient for folks that are struggling to get off work in time, we're going to be starting at 6 o'clock instead of 5.30 and finishing up around, our goal is finishing up by 7.30. Uh, one of the things we're going to be talking about, well, you, you see the number 40 listed throughout the Bible. We just heard one of the instances this morning. Uh, the Israelites walked for 40 years in the desert. Jonah was in the well for 40. I mean, we go on and on. Uh, but Lent is partly to commemorate and to uh, observe Jesus' 40 days at the beginning of his ministry in the wilderness. So we're going to be looking at Lent. What is Lent? How do we, uh, how do we uh, prepare ourselves for the risen Christ? You know, the liturgy calls Lent this joyful season. It's kind of like the mud season of the electionary calendar. It's necessary. Things happen. And what happens at the end is really joyous. So, please, there's a sign-up sheet in the back if you want to bring bread, butter, beverage, or soup. Um, and I was probably made the sign-up sheet uh, in the middle of the night or something because I didn't leave enough room for everything. So, uh, I crossed out the other day so the sign-up sheet is just for Thursday. Now, it's going to start a week from this Thursday. You got Ash Wednesday this week, and then a week from Thursday on March 5th, 6 o'clock, over the parish house. Uh, and everybody's welcome. All ages, come as you are. If you just got off work and you're covered with grease, that's okay. I used to do that. <laughs> uh, and then, last week, did anybody read this little flyer that was in their bulletin? Good. Well, good. Some of you uh, It's it's referred to as miso. Uh, we came up with that. Uh, uh, I can't even remember the name that word. Uh, what what happens when we join initials together? But it stands for the main school of ministry, and it was started. Uh, after the academy, or the second academy graduation class, and, was, and after Bangor closed its doors to students. <laughs> Currently, there is no seminary in the state of Maine. There is a Bible school, a very conservative Bible school. Uh, Andover Newton has moved. So, there's nothing within close distance for anybody that wants to take additional classes. The main school of ministry and I brought a, I brought a uh, synopsis of one of the classes that's being offered uh, this spring. And I'll, I've printed it out so you can take a look at it. It's a college class. That's what these are. Okay? Lots of reading, lots of writing. Okay? It's not just you go and sit on, on your back for a uh, hour and a half on a Saturday afternoon. These are multiple days uh, for the for the semester. It's usually one or maximum two uh, days, and it's a Saturday a month. But it is a big commitment. The cost is very affordable, uh, and I believe there's probably funds in the in the church to help pay for it too, if you wish. the The goal of the main school of ministry is support spiritual foundation and formation for everyone, not just, not just clergy. Nurture calls to all form of ministry, whether you're serving as a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, whatever. These are, these are great. Equip authorized ministers with quality continuing education. Uh, last year there was a uh, class on the polity, that's the government of the Congregational Church, or the UCC. And also, just plain for spiritual enrichment, personal spiritual enrichment. I've printed out uh, an email from uh, Reverend, Reverend uh, Blood, our conference minister, as well as a message from the dean. And I'm going to leave this synopsis in the back so you can see that these are serious classes. Um, also, on the sideboard, on the left sideboard uh, back, there's a basket. 
with a uh, Lewis sign on it. Well, we're taking a free will offering make, uh, if you, uh, for the main school of ministry. You can either make the check out to the main conference, or if you wish to make the check out to this church, uh, the secretary or the treasurer will write one check to send it to the main conference school of ministry. It's a very good program. I cannot endorse it enough. Uh, and the relationships that you build during this class are fantastic. <coughs> now, I don't have to drive, or I, I don't, we don't have to go to Bangor anymore. The classes are, are in Augusta. Easy to get to. Break down Western Avenue, Bang 11, there's the conference office. Uh, but the relationships you build in these classes is, is just fantastic. And I'm getting the time is up. For my <laughs> Thank you. I was hoping something would come up, because I got a notice of that as well. And it's a wonderful school. A lot of these students go on to become ministers. So it's a valuable school. What do you want to make? Preceding your preparation. Okay. To see the glory of God, one must rise up and seek God's countenance. May our hearts prepare for a change that is purposeful, reflection. So with this joy within us, we say, let us worship God with our morning offering.
praise God, to you we offer our substance. May there be a mystery of increase as these tithes and offerings are dedicated to your purpose. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And let us sing together hymn number 252, O Word of God incarnate.
I'd like the people, huh? <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. 
neurological disorders, and delirium tremens. If you remember the ad on television with the man with Parkinson's, the ad for his medication, but they show the hallucination. He sees a dog and something else. A vision is a healthy state that leaves the recipient with more clarity to a problem or to an issue or doubt that he or she might have been struggling with in their faith. A vision is clearer than dreams and contains fewer psychological connotations than dreams. Visions generally emerge from spiritual traditions and could provide a lens into human nature and reality. They are religious experiences that can be seen. Prophets often are associated with visions and are compelled to proclaim what they have seen. A beatific vision is what Paul refers to when in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, he says, then we shall see face to face. He is referring to seeing God in a vision face to face. And all will be clear. How we see God and what a vision believes leaves us with is joy, leaves us with happiness, and a delight in immortality. A vision leaves us with an epiphany, the aha experience, and with a resolution to our question. Thus speaks Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs>